The next topic in today's webinar is infection control practices in the ICU setting. Hospital acquired infections are now being monitored very closely and discussed very widely uh, to improve the quality of care provided to our patients. So to elaborate the various aspects on this subject, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. V. Ramasubramaniam, currently a senior consultant in infectious diseases, HIV and tropical medicine at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai, and a professor at the Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, besides many other notable appointments. He is a graduate of Madras Medical College and postgraduate from PJ Chandigarh, and he has been trained in infectious diseases in UK after getting his MRCP. He has authored several research publications and chapters in textbooks and has been the principal investigator in several international drug trials. I now welcome Dr. Ramasubramaniam to present his talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Anuradha, for the kind words of introduction. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my task over the next 15 minutes or so is to speak to you about infection control practices in the ICU setting. And I'm talking about something which I have been doing for the last uh, over 20 years. And I still find it very sad that there is no ownership of this infection control practices in any hospital because the doctors are busy with their own medical issues. The nurses are busy with their own aspects of nursing care. And it is the role of the medical, the infection control officer, the infection control nurse to ensure that infection control practices are put in place. But if the, 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 the shall I say, the responsibility of following this is still left to the individual. When there is a problem, I always get pulled out. But when we ask for cooperation, sometimes it is very difficult to get it from various healthcare work personnel because each of them is busy with, with his own responsibility. So I, I think I would urge all of you that this is something which unless all of us do is not going to get us to where we need to go. So that is the first earnest plea I want to make. Now, infection control and quality in healthcare has changed over the last 150 years. It started with the responsibility of only doctors. Subsequently, the nurses came in. Then it became a combined effect of doctors and nurses. More intensive care nurses came in. And then we started getting other aspects of infection, information technology, you know, the administrators, all of them contribute. And actually, I would say what the, the graph has, the picture has missed is the health, the, the housekeeping, the dietary personnel, the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, all of them have a role to play with regard to infection control. It all started with the scenic study way back in 1970s, where they showed that without the aspects of infection control, the incidence of infections were significantly high. And when you brought in an infection control nurse and looked into the aspects of infection control, there was a significant drop in the occurrence of infections. Now the money saved, the lives saved are all unfortunately not tangible. You cannot quantify it with every hospital because when you ask somebody to spend say this amount of money on an infection control nurse or practices of infection control unfortunately there is no if the person asks for what is the return on of investments there is nothing specific you can show them and that is always the problem still we face in most hospitals when we urge them to uh, you know appoint somebody to be responsible for infection control there are several key solutions and perspectives of infection control prevention and interventions. It starts with designing the ICU, the standard precautions, hand hygiene and wearing of personal protective equipment, the care bundles, isolation of patients, cleaning and disinfection, including equipment and medical devices, appropriate staffing. This is something which has really come to fore with the COVID epidemic. We realize that when there is a shortage of trained, skilled medical personnel, the infection rate automatically increases. And this is very difficult to convince the administrators. When we ask them, they say, oh, you've got 10 beds, you've got 25 nurses, that the numbers are perfectly valid. But we don't realize that unless these 25 are skilled in the ICU management of patients, infection control is not going to be uh, you know, easy. We also need to put in place antimicrobial stewardship, improving staff education and accountability, which is an ongoing basis occupational health to ensure that the people who are staffed are well taken care of and protected, and most importantly, improving reporting and surveillance. Surveillance and reporting has always been an issue. If there is no data, there is no problem. So when you go to a hospital and ask, what is the surgical site infection rate? Oh, we don't have any infections because there is no system of 
tracking and reporting infections in surgical patients. So you need to put in place a system of surveillance before you can look at the data to say what improvements need to be done. Over the next 10, 12 minutes or so, I'm going to concentrate only on aspects which are not given the importance they should be given. For example, I'm often called when an ICU is ready and you know before they put in the beds and other things, I'm called to say, okay, now it's all ready. Can you look up and say what we need to do for infection control? Unfortunately, that is not the time you can do anything about infection control. The, the process should start even before they plan the ICU. You need to have adequate bed space. You need to put in place an, place an isolation room. The commonest I find is there are no sinks. I'm not talking about ICU, but specifically when a new wing of a hospital is opened and I go and say, where are the sinks? Oh, the sinks, it is not aesthetic if you put the sink in this place. You know, it will affect the looks of the ward. That is the reply I get. And very sadly, we still, I've been, as I said, for over 20 years doing this, and I still find the same problem every time a new room or a new ward or a new wing is constructed. We need to put in place isolation rooms. We need to put in place clean and dirty utility rooms. Wash sinks with a certified source. Feed preparation area, something which nobody bothers about patient transportation routes, supply and service corridors, and environmental control systems. Unless you plan all of these before you start construction, this is going to be a problem all through your uh, stay in the hospital. If at all, there is one message I want to pass to everybody today is this, clean hands save lives. We invest in shoe covers, we invest in, in chapels before we enter the ICU, we invest in, you know, changing our dress, none of which matters. What matters is our hands. All you need is make provision for every bed in the ICU to have this on the foot side of the, the bed. This one intervention, not just this intervention, the, to ensure that everybody uses this appropriately is going to be the biggest boon of preventing infections in hospital, in the ICU. You need to ensure that all of this is done. A simple, consistent and effective approach. Hand washing, use of gloves, personal protective equipment, use of resistance gowns or apron, resistant gowns or aprons, safe handling of shops, waste, handling of soil linen and environmental cleaning. It is becoming more and more obvious that environment is a major source of infection. It started with a similar fashion in the 1960s and 70s where they put a lot of importance in cleaning the environment and then subsequently Fogging was given up, cleaning became secondary, till we have gone a full cycle and realized that acinetobacter, MRSA, VRE, and Clostridium difficile are all sitting by the patient's bedside, left over by a previous patient to infect the next one. So this is something we need to take care of. Every ICU needs an isolation room. You need to ensure that there are negative pressure rooms with appropriate engineering controls to take care. We have realized this during times of COVID. And let me tell you one thing, COVID is going to be with us. It's not just the third wave or the fourth wave. It is going to be another flu amidst us. We need to make sure that we have isolation rooms. We cannot have a separate COVID ward in the long run. We will have our patients. We will have a patient with COVID who needs an isolation room. And this is something which is going to become mandatory for all ICUs. The airborne infection isolation with negative pressure rooms, a minimum of six air exchanges and more than 12 for areas under renovation or new construction. There should be engineering controls. The room should be appropriately sealed and exhaust should be done, if possible, way above the hospital terraces or away from the other wards. How many rooms do you need? We don't know. No recommendations, but at least... Till recently, it was at least 100 for every 100 beds, you need one isolation room. So for India, I would say you need a little more with the keep, keeping in mind the, the tropical infections and tuberculosis. We need to have more rooms built into the ICU to take care of this problem so that we don't run into searching for rooms or, you know, give uh, the, the problem a miss when we have a case of open tuberculosis. Droplet precaution again, we need to isolate areas with at least significant gaps between beds. If we are able to get a single room, that's excellent. And may, people should be made to use surgical mask and gloves uh, when we are entering the room and probably gowns if you're going to be in intimate contact with the patient. Another area which is unfortunately not focused upon is the wash areas. The hand rub should be one hand rub for every bed. 
sinks should be ideally one for every two beds for at least one every five beds. It has been very clearly shown that sinks harbor significant colony forming units of, uh, units of gram negative bacilli, including Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter and Carbipenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae. They have often been reported as source of outbreaks. We need to ensure that the splashback risk and the distance between the, the tap and the plug hole is optimized to minimize the splashing so that when there is pseudomonas and you open the tap and it splashes out, so this should be away from the patient so that this is not a source of infection. Feed preparation area is another issue which is not being looked at all in any ICU. I know that feed preparation happens probably in the kitchen and it comes up, but this, if there is a place allocated for it is very important because food can be a source of infection and also outbreaks. Appropriate storage, you know, this is how we find most of our, you know, you go behind the patient rooms and open any room, this is how things are stored. We need to ensure that provisions for storage is optimized even before to ensure what we need for whatever number of beds our ICU is going to have. These are small things which will make a big difference. So this has to be looked into when you plan the ICU. What about care bundles? You know, care bundles are basically, bundles are a collection of things. And this, uh, you know, uh, mind-blowing paper, which was published by Pronovost et al., showed that a simple adherence to five evidence-based interventions resulted in a 66% reduction of bloodstream infections. And since then, the checklist and the bundle, uh, care bundle approach has made a phenomenal difference in ICUs. It is basically a collection of interventions, a simple three to five points or interventions, which you can choose for your own hospital and customize it. Most importantly, you need to ensure that every staff applies all the interventions consistently for all patients all the time. So for example, if you take a ventilatory associated uh, pneumonia bundle care, you can choose two or three or four or five hand hygiene before you handle any of the respiratory circuit, head and elevation, oral care with 0.2% chlorhexidine, subglottic suctioning two hourly, ensuring that the endotracheal cuff pressure is monitored eight hourly and give a sedation vacation and spontaneous breathing trial. I'm sorry for the typo trial. This has to be applied consistently for all the patient all the time by everyone. And these are simple measures everybody can adhere to to significantly minimize the risk of infections. So this is the way forward bundling approach for anything, whether it is a line infection, a surgical site infection, a WAP or a central line infection. It can be applied to any intervention focused in reducing infections in the hospital, especially in the ICU. Another aspect which is, I'm happy gaining slow prominence is antimicrobial stewardship. You'll see the first point in the antimicrobial stewardship is the leadership commitment. Without administrative backing and leadership commitment, this is impossible. You need to have accountability for every doctor who uses antibiotics in the ICU. You need drug expertise through a pharmacist or it can be even otherwise in smaller hospitals. You need to track, report and educate people. This is something if we don't take it up now, I think we are doomed with regard to use of antibiotics because again, with the COVID, we are using so many antibiotics inappropriately that we will soon have untreatable infections. A simple deterrent, I shouldn't call it a deterrent, actually it is something which will justify the use of antibiotics, but it is a det deterrent, is the use of high-end antibiotic form. In our hospital, we have said that any doctor can use any antibiotic because unlike government hospitals, we can say that Oh, the, the, the third generation cephalosporins, a house surgeon can write. If you have to write a beta lactam, beta lactamase, a postgraduate can write. If you need to write a carbapenem, an assistant, if you need to use a cholestin, the head of the department has to sign. Instead of that, which is not possible in a private hospital, we have introduced the high end antibiotic form. You can see that we have identified several antibiotics, including, say, for example, ceftazidine, evibactam, cholestin, daptomycin, doripenem. Uh, phosphomycin, uh, imipenem, meropenem, linozolid, polymyxin, ticoplanin, tigicycline, and vancomycin. So if you are writing any of these antibiotics, it is mandated that you fill this form up and write why you're choosing this as an empiric therapy. So this has to be filled. We have an antibiotic nurse who collects, uh, you know, these forms when they are filled. 
everybody is urged and encouraged to send cultures before writing antibiotics, you need to ensure that when the culture report comes and it is positive and the patient is improving, you de-escalate. I am very proud to say in our hospital, the de-escalation rate is above 90%. And if you are not changing for whatever reason, either your culture is not positive or if you are not de-escalating, you need to justify. And similarly, the choice of surgical prophylaxis is also closely monitored. So these are simple things which can be done in any hospital to ensure that people are accountable for antibiotic use. And lastly, biomedical waste management, I think now this has become legally mandated. And this is something which is important for all ICUs. So I'm going to stop here and leave you with a message that what matters is with inflection control is the universal application and accountability by every healthcare worker. Because we know that in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. So if we become responsible for what we do in the ICU, accountable to ensure that the patient's safety is paramount, I think we can do a better job. I'm going to stop here and open to questions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was a very interesting session and uh, very practical too. Uh, the first question is, they want you to comment on the 0.2% of tenidin usage instead of chlorhexidin for oral care. I think octanidin is gaining uh, some sort of importance uh, as an alternative to chlorhexidine. There are a lot of allegations that chlorhexidine may encourage the occurrence of uh, resistance bacteria. Octanidine is a European issue. It is not very common in the US. So it will take time to keep in place, but it is very attractive, except for the fact that it is much more expensive than chlorhexidine, but that's a good alternative. Yes. And the, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The other question is, uh, what are the audits uh, which have to be done in the ICU by your infection control nurse? I think audits, you can choose the audits. It definitely, you need to know antimicrobial stewardship and auditing antimicrobial usage is very important. You can audit the care bundles for various things which you put in place. You can audit environmental cleanliness and monitoring uh, the, the cleaning of environment, housekeeping staff, and also whichever methodology you use to clean the environment. You can audit the occurrence of, uh, you know, adverse events. You, you can set up, it's not like, this is, this is just using common sense and finding out what can be improved in the ICO. And for every factor, you can audit it to come up with improvement. Thank you, sir. So uh, the next question is uh, about the discarding of a half-use blood bag. What's the infection control practices? I think things are now very, very straightforward. The NABH has excellent guidelines on how do you need to go about. There is no confusion in these matters. So as long as you adhere to it, I'm not even going to you know, explain things. It's all pre-written. Uh, you know, written. As long as it is followed, I think it is very easy. And uh, for ventilator patients, how often the mouth care should be done? Ideally, every two hours, uh, if it is feasible but at least once or twice every shift is what I would suggest. And again, uh, in a ventilated patient, uh, does suctioning of oral secretions before each uh, positional change, does it reduce the instance of uh, VAP, ventilated associated pneumonia? Yes, it does reduce, but this is effective only if all the other things are in place. You know, there is no point in doing this if you, if you are not following the basic requirements, which means use of hand hygiene, use of, you know, uh, endotracheal cuff pressure and monitoring all that. So you do all that and every additional measure does add to the benefit in preventing in, uh, infections. And the last question we will take now is uh, in a back bundle, if the head elevation is not possible uh, due to some brain surgery, can some other parameter be taken? I think but you need to customize it. I agree. Not everything is possible in all patients. So you need to use just common sense to decide if that is not possible, it is not possible. So you need to ensure that other measures are followed more diligently to prevent infections. That is all. I will just add two points here. One, yes. always use your common sense. You know, you don't need to have a manual. If you use your common sense, that's always good. And two, never try to be ideal in anything. You have to go one step at a time. So you may have to compromise in, in certain issues, but as long as you go step by step, every step is a way forward. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I think everyone needs to be accountable for his own actions in the IC to improve the infection control practices. Thank you very much, sir. It was quite interesting. And I do know that your experience in uh, the infection control practices would have been an eye-opener for all the listeners here today.